Hey, what's up? I'm Hexi. I play games, make games everywhere. And today I'm in Chapultepec Park in Mexico City, where I come and run about two to three times a week because apparently tacos are not healthy. Today we got a special guest, Soul Spark, who's gonna talk to us about how he started making Minecraft mods, to boss fights, to dungeon crawlers. If you like this kind of content, be sure to like, subscribe, hit that bell icon for more notifications, and let's get going. We have a special guest, Soul Spark, and we'll be going over his latest game, Rogue Hype. Hey there, what's up? I'm Soul Spark. I'm a game developer for Hype Pipe. I like creating games in Hype Pipe. I've been doing that for a while, and I hope to continue doing it in the future because I have a lot of ideas when it comes to reality. Oh, Soul Spark, love your games on Hype Pipe. How did you hear about Hype Pipe, and what made you want to start making games in Hype Pipe? The first time I actually saw Hype Pipe because I was playing better. Badland again. After several years of not playing it, Badland is the, the first game of Frogmind and it was having like a special uh, pop-up uh, at the start of the game, which told you like, we're going to create a new project, a revolutionary new platform. And I did. And I'm, I'm so glad I decided to, to click on that. It's the one type of ad that I click on and I'm really glad I did because oh, it was, it was an ad. Uh, yeah, kind of like an ad, like a, a pop-up thingy, uh, but it, it really called my attention. Like it's the kind of thing that I've always wanted to have on my and it was right there and I knew that Frogmine knew how to do this because uh, the Battleland editor is also amazing so I was just I really trusted what they were doing and it seems like I was right <laughs> in doing that I really really like these kinds of platforms where you can create UTC user generated content like the, the games that I like playing the most other than like action games and fighting boss fight games <laughs> are like uh, Minecraft for example or Jump to Dash these games where you can create your own things and, and share with other people for them to try out. I really enjoy that process. Touching on that, had you made games before Hype Hype? Yes, I have. The first time I actually made a game was a long time ago, around eight years, when I was learning Unity. But I never really got along with Unity very well. I made a few games, but they were mostly for like school projects. They didn't turn out too well. But the way I like making the games the most before I started making games with Hype Hype was in platforms like uh, Jump to Dash or Minecraft or the Badland editor, even that could uh, let me create my own little experiences and try out my own things. One thing that I used to do, I was making mods for Minecraft because the game has a really extensive mod community and I decided, you know what, I really like playing mods, but I would like even more making my own mods. I spent a little time learning Java and how to create a mod and everything. And oh, wow. I published one. I published one and I, I think it did pretty well. <laughs> uh, like uh, quite a few people actually got to play it and it's, it's pretty fun nothing too big but uh, it really helped me see that i can actually create my own things for the games that i like and i think that's really exciting so these are mods that you created for minecraft which is what you're using before making games in hype hype yep this is like an extension that you can add to minecraft and which adds new things or changes in the game and uh, i really like the idea of creating my own extensions for the game that i used to play for so long and i just decided you know what i like tea and i like minecraft so let's mix the two of them and see if i can actually create <laughs> tea in minecraft and i did and quite a few people enjoyed it as you can see there's a lot of, of people here who try the mod pack out and that's mainly why i like modding in the first place and putting like a bunch of creations from the community together into a single big experience it felt like playing a whole new game and i really wanted to contribute to those somehow you started out playing minecraft and you started creating mods within minecraft you discovered you enjoyed that creation process when you found a high pipe you just clicked you discovered high pipe and then you just started making games yeah on your phone like exactly it was a really random day i was scrolling through my phone there and then i realized there was a notification about high pipe and saying and announcing the gem for may 2021 and i just thought wait this app it's been here on my phone for like three months i've downloaded it a long time ago but i never got to, to use it maybe i should take a look at it because i was ignoring it because i was working on the mods but then i decided you know well, my mod is doing pretty well already i can probably take a break from it and, and try this this new thing out and i realized that it was actually really easy to use and very powerful which 
just like the one thing that I was missing in those previous platforms I tried using. They were really cool, really, really nice feeling of creating your own things. But I just realized they took a little too much effort to get not much done. So Hypepipe was kind of the opposite. It allowed me to do a lot with not nearly as much effort as before. And I decided to start creating my own things and seeing what I could do with the editor. That's how I made the first batch of games for the, the Mega Game Jam in May. The first time I used Hypepipe, uh, technically was, I think, around um, March or February, but I like I opened the app, I tried out uh, a few things, and I realized that I didn't understand how it worked because I, I didn't bother taking a look into how it worked. I just uh, brushed it off like, yeah, it's probably not gonna do too much. But like when I really started using it for real, it was in May in 2021. One. Ever since, uh, just been creating games with it. That's cool. And the, That's the, cool. First, the first few games that I made, I put them all into a playlist here, which is uh, this one. Uh, uh, and yeah, which, this is one of my favorites. What were you saying? Yeah, this playlist actually won one of the, the prizes during the Mega Game Jam. And I think that really made me see that you know, the games that I made actually were really enjoyed by people. And I should keep making those because it was worth it. You know, I wasn't making something that a few people would see. I was making something that a lot of people could see and that would enjoy and reach more. It's, oh, yeah. So you, you took your experience from making mods in Minecraft to making full on boss battles in high pipe exactly <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's cool no that's cool man <laughs> yeah it's it's not the same like uh, minecraft i was making a mod about drinking tea peacefully and then i came to high pipe i'm gonna make boss fights and then i want to see bloodshed that was a big change but i kind of mixed the two things that i really like creating games and playing games about big boss fights against epic bosses that's the, the kind of stuff i really like i mixed the two and that's how i made these before we jump into Rogue Hype, I'm curious if you have any suggestions for newbies like myself into Hype Hype. I think the biggest challenge with Hype Hype is not giving up. Like that's the, the hardest part about it. It's really easy to just feel overwhelmed and think, oh, I can't keep doing this. I, I'm not gonna get anywhere. But uh, like I felt that many times when I was getting started, a lot of things felt really overwhelming. But I, I just decided I'm not gonna give up. I'm not gonna stop. I, I wanna finish this game and I will finish this game. And really that's the key to being able to make an amazing game like this. As long as you, you don't lose hope and you keep thinking I'm gonna get there sometime. A lot of my games also have the same idea. Like I see that a lot of people start playing them, but they, they give up halfway through. They, they don't actually finish it. Uh, so I, I feel like and the, the biggest problem with high type as a whole is that people give up very soon. And uh, you shouldn't give up, you can do it. You just need to stay motivated and keep going and eventually and, we'll get there. Yeah, and Soulspark, I think that's a really great point because when it comes to developing games of any capacity, whether a simple game or a boss fight, you will always have the challenges of trying to complete whatever you're working on. Like that almost never goes away because that's almost a part of game development. You will always face a challenge that you will need to overcome. And while you may not know how to overcome it, you will figure it out if you keep trying. Exactly. Uh, you, the, the biggest challenge is just really not giving up because it feels very, very overwhelming. But uh, there's a lot of people to help you. Uh, if you need help as well. True, uh, true. High Pipe is a really welcoming community full of, of people available to give you any help you need. So you don't give up if you ever stressed out, just <laughs> come and chill in the server and we can give you some help. I remember when I was living in New York City, they have a really good community of game developers or aspiring game developers. It just made everything easier because there was a community of people who were trying to do the same thing. And High Pipe has that with the Discord channel and its community in general and weekly live streams and such. Yeah, exactly. On Hype Hype. Hypes are also called games. Games are hypes. That's kind of the lingo in the Hype Hype community. I spent a couple hours playing this last week and we got the main character with the backpack. He's got a cool sword and 
Yeah, so tell me about Rogue Hype. Uh, Rogue Hype is a project that I, I really wanted to work on in Hype Hype. I've always been fond of the idea of these roguelike style games. I think I used to play one on my phone, which is called Pixel Dungeon. And it was really fascinating, you know, like randomly generated dungeons for different enemies and, and items. And every run was different. Everyone had his own risks. And I really wanted to bring that to Hype Hype because I felt like there was nothing like it yet. So I decided, let's give it a try. But uh, it turns out that it was, uh, there were a lot of things that I needed to do. And it took me a while, but I, I'm really happy with how it turned out. Putting everything together, all of these different mechanics, all these different parts. You can see that there's a lot of different things that make it work. There's a dialogue, tons of logic here, tons of logic for the enemy. I'm even working on some new logic for the enemies that will let me create maybe some special enemies, perhaps. And this is uh, the logic for the generation. There's plenty of stuff here that makes it all work. Rogue Hype was a very big project. A lot of complex mechanics interacting together, but it really allowed for a very interesting new experience that I think wasn't really a possibility in Hype Hype before. One thing I think is really cool about this game is that the levels, they're all procedurally generated. Is that right? So every time you play, it's almost like a different maze. Exactly. The the whole point of the, the roguelike genre is that you can't memorize the levels. You have to actually learn the mechanics of the game and how everything works. Because every time you play, it's going to be a different maze of rooms. Every time you play, you're going to find different enemies in different locations and the items will be different. You never know how it's going to play out. So you just have to be familiar with how the mechanics of the game work. And that's how you can thrive and win at it. In order to implement this, it actually took a lot. <laughs> you can see that this is all the logic that goes into the generation. It's surprisingly simple, actually. But and you did all this, this on your phone. Yep, all of this and all of those things over there too. All of that was made on a phone <laughs> over so you, the course of many days. So you said this is surprisingly simple. I love if you could break down some of the mechanics. When it comes to high pipe, you don't necessarily need to know how everything works. You kind of just have to make sure you don't break anything. Exactly. I think it's a good idea to know a little bit about how it works because that way you can know what you can do and what you can't do and to make it still work. Yeah. That's why yeah. I'm working on a little documentation uh, for Rogue Hype, which explains some of the basic mechanics. It is still very much still a work in progress, but it already has a few pages. Oh, on wow. Some of the, the topics. On Where the was that? Where did you click the... It's this little guy here called oh, show, show Documentation. documentation. Okay, okay. You can just turn it on and off and it shows all this. And you can see here that it gives some brief explanations on how the mechanics work. Very I'm trying cool. to make it very brief indeed because uh, I don't think anyone would want to spend like an hour reading documentations about uh, hype and they would rather remake something else but this is a it's a pretty good explanation already if you want to i can give like a and just a quick rundown of how everything works. Yeah, I would love a quick rundown. The basics of the generation is that you have some objects, like these connectors, uh, which are these uh, arrow-like objects. And these, uh, at the start of the game, they're going to cause a new room to be generated in front of them, which will be chosen from a list of different rooms. As you can see, there's lots of lists of rooms, and it's going to choose one random object from each one of these lists to spawn in front of the connector and these rooms that will be spawned in have more connectors which will cause more rooms to be spawned in a chain until eventually you end up with rooms such as this one which doesn't have any connectors and then the generation stops um, that's ba the basics of the generation if i only did this it would look kind of boring because um, oh so wait the, the arrows connect to the ball exactly are they, are they uh, color coded or um the there is a the little bit of color coding. coding. You can do it, um, but by default, like there is a system set up so that it's automatically going to choose one of these groups of spawners to spawn the rooms that are most appropriate. So, for example, at the the start of the dungeon near the entrance, it's going to generate rooms that are more uh, wide, like this one, uh, so right. that it makes the, the dungeon more open at the start. And then, as you get closer to the end, it will begin to curve more and generate more of these or more of these rooms, for example, which we just cut off the generation. You can actually customize all of this by changing the chances and the properties of how the generation works, which is just what makes uh, this template so flexible, <laughs> even though it's a little bit daunting to use. Uh, okay, so, so the arrows connect to 
the diamonds and then the diamonds spawn the rooms yep uh, the arrows will connect to these diamonds and these diamonds will choose one of these random rooms uh, to spawn there each of these diamonds has a different list of rooms that it can spawn like this one has all these different rooms it will choose one of these random rooms to spawn and at the position of the arrow whereas this one it has a different list of, of rooms that it can spawn and then uh, essentially the further you go away from the entrance of the dungeon it will travel between these spawners so near oh. the entrance it will use this one then uh, like four or five rooms away from the entrance we use this green one then we'll begin using the purple one and then at the end we we'll use this red one to just stop the generation otherwise the dungeon will generate forever but <laughs> it causes a lot of crashes <laughs> a lot of crashes <laughs> when tested it. yeah and a little advice I can give if you want to use a template and you don't want to have these crashes is, is to perhaps go to this little magical option here, which is the generation step. This is basically how long it takes between each time that the connectors will be replaced with rooms. So if I set this to one, for example, it makes for a really interesting effect where basically you can see the rooms being generated one by one and that prevents you from just immediately generating a million dungeons and causing the game to crash. That is so, cool. And it's very useful for debugging what's going on, like why does this room generate here, why is there a floating painting, these kinds of things all are simplified by messing around with this, which is really convenient. Usually you want to set it to 001, so that's pretty much instant, uh, but uh, for debugging it's very useful to set it to high values. Uh, another important part of the generation, by the way, is these little gift boxes this year. The gift box are placement holders. Exactly. They they hold a position that will be replaced with a prop when the game generates. So, uh, for instance, these red boxes here, they are enemy spawn points. So uh, when the game runs, you will choose a random enemy ah. to spawn. Here. And then these brown ones will choose a random furniture, like a bench or a pot or a crate to spawn here. So each of these boxes, they do have a color coding, which will correspond to a different spawner that will spawn a different room. It's a very similar system to these. The main difference is that these connectors actually check if there is a room in front of them before they generate, so that they don't generate two rooms on top of one another. Uh, these guys don't do that. The, 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 the gift boxes don't need to do that. But they use a very similar generation system. In these, which means if you learn how this works, you have already learned how two different things in the template work, which makes it really worth it uh, to understand how these uh, spawners work. It's not too complicated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, definitely not a bunch of crazy links here. No, it's very easy. By the way, another important thing to point out this is where the props are located. So these are all the different things that can generate in the dungeon inside of the rooms. Like you have the trees here, and the, these are the trees that you might have seen. Uh, these are the decorations that are mounted on the wall. Like and this, all these this. props are from the High Pipe Asset Library. Exactly. Like all of these are just either a single model or multiple models. Like this one has a little stone thing at the bottom, so that's not just a, a weird tree in the middle of the room. And these ones. Uh, I actually put a little pink model, which has like an animation, even I can make it play. But it's actually just a pink model with a base uh, that I got from the asset. So everything here is just normal high pipe stuff, and just used in clever ways. Where so, are the birds that sit on the bird bath, and then they fly away when the oh, player... They're yeah. right here. This is the bird bath, and yeah. these are the birds right next to them. The way they actually check when the player's close is very simple. There's this node here, which is the object mass operator, checks the distance between two objects. So it checks the distance between the bird and the player, and when that exceeds a certain value, they just run away. It's that simple. Uh, th that's the truth with most of the logic here. It might seem complicated, but really, if you take some time to look at it, yeah, it's just like really simple. Um, Do you have the bird like get destroyed later on, or does the bird just continue to exist in the world, but it's hidden or it's flying away? Or uh, That's actually a good point. <laughs> the birds shouldn't be destroyed but they don't i might add this uh, usually i have <laughs> like uh, an interval so that they get destroyed automatically but this is an important thing this is a uh, it's worth noting uh, you're probably going to notice that pretty much everything in the dungeon has this gray group which yeah. uh this dark gray group which basically means once the dungeon is completed you should destroy all of that because you're going to generate a new level you don't want some birds from the previous level staying the new level that you generate so basically ah. everything is going to have this gray group 
to ensure that when the game actually says, okay, we're done with this level, we can get rid of all that and just open up room for the next dungeon. So uh, pretty much everything has this great group. Either that or they have this for the group, which is the, the orange group um, that's used for the walls, which is um, used by these connectors to check if there's a room there or not. So all of the walls and the floor, they all have this orange group, which is basically used to detect if there's already a room at a certain position or not. But if you use like these rooms as a, as a template, you shouldn't have to worry about these groups and any of that, um, because they already have these correct groups. Um, all right, what else do I need to, to say here? Do, do you have any questions, by the way, about any of this? I find all this fascinating. I'm curious, where's the character movement and attack? Is that Do you have a separate oh. container for that? Oh, yeah, here's the thing. I actually separated the editor into two parts. You can see that there is these floating black boxes, like the enemies and the player, yeah. and the dialogue and the generation. There's one here at the top as well. All of these are basically the, the things that make the game work, which you're probably not going to have to worry about. Uh, like usually what you're going to be doing with the template is in the back here. Uh, but I did leave these things here in the front so you can take a look at them. And this is exactly where the player fighter logic is, and where the punch attack is, player health. All of this is right here. Uh, I just uh, collapsed them so that you wouldn't like to like, pollute the entire view. But uh, this is it's still all here. And this is in fact, almost identical to the logic you get from here, from the asset browser, but I made some changes so that it works with the template. But the logic is very similar uh, for the player fights and the player movement. And the same for, for the enemies. The enemies are mostly just what I got from the template, like the pre-mates, but I made some changes. One very important change I made to the enemies in this template is a ray casting. So you might have noticed that if I play the game, this zombie, if I actually go behind a wall here, the zombie's not going to be able to see me anymore. It's, it's not going to be chasing me down because he can't see me. But as soon as I go into his view, he can see me and follow me around. That's cool. Yeah, that's the way cast. Yeah, that's the because of this guy here who is going to check for a player. And if it doesn't find one, it's not going to follow the player around. This is the, like, the main change I've made to this. Uh, most of this is still the same as it is like the original. So I, I'm not going to rely on this because this new system is very, very very fancy and it makes this a lot easier. I mean, it looks a lot more complicated, but if you understand how this works, it's like so much easier to, to create new enemies. I'm gonna talk more about this, like maybe in a in a, another annual post or something. Uh, yeah. But yeah, this is a this is a pretty useful little thing that I'm working on. I think this is a very cool overview of Rogue Hive. Do you have any recommendations when it comes to learning all the different nodes and things? And to learn the different nodes? Well, that's that's a good question because I don't remember how I actually did it. I just know that I kind of learned it, but I don't remember how. The way that I learned how to use nodes, uh, it was mostly like experimenting with the different nodes, like seeing if, okay, if I do this, does it work? If I do that, does it not work? And then I also used the pre-mates as a reference. Uh, these guys okay. are very useful. Like they have logic, we know that it works, but the problem with them is that they are sometimes very overwhelming for a newcomer. Like if you look at this, you're probably not going to understand half of what's going on here. Not, not even right. I understand what's going on. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's pretty overwhelming, but there are some of them that are a little bit simpler, which you can take a look at to at least understand how some basics work like how variables work how prepares work all that yeah. is very important and that's one thing i do like about hype hype is that you can go into any game and see how it works and mess around with the node and trying to get them exactly. to work in whatever way you want exactly that's uh that's another thing i did a lot <laughs> i used to take a look at the at other games that i played and thought that's really cool how do they do that i want to make that in my game and i, I just remixed it and i took a look at it obviously just for inspiration not going to directly copy their logic but i, I want to at least understand how the logic worked and yeah. what nodes they used to and whenever i i found something like i don't know how to do that uh, i just I just remixed it and I took a look at it and saw if I, if I understood the, the purpose of that node there. 
and why it allowed me to do that. But I think the, the hardest things to learn in High Five are probably going to be like the very casting, the, the lists, you know, like the, the broadcasters are a little confusing as well. But you get used to it. Uh, if, as you keep doing it, you just kind of get familiar with the notes. If you keep doing a lot of logic and eventually you're going to get like very used to it. Yeah, if you're looking at it every day, then you're going to start to connect the dots. Exactly. And looking at edits, looking at things that work. <laughs> Preferably, don't don't just get stuck with a single problem and just keep hammering it. It's not gonna get you anywhere. But take breaks and you know, like uh, try seeing other things, try get some inspiration. Because if it's not working, then there must be something wrong. We just need to think about it. I would recommend you to just try finding the games that you like and you try understanding them. That's the the best method of learning. And I would I'd say that not just for high pipe, but like uh, in general, if you want to learn how to make games, the, the most important thing is understanding how the game that you like work because if you can do that you know how to make a game that you like and that's already makes the process worth it yeah i think that's great advice playing games is really important because that's where you can follow the things that you enjoy so if you like racing games or if you like puzzle games the cool thing with high pipe is you can hit the remix button see how those games are done and even if you don't understand it, you can still take a look. And in time, the more and more you get used to game development, the more your knowledge will grow. So it's important to play and research as many games as possible. Agreed, agreed. Thanks for taking the time to go over this amazing game. It's, it's my pleasure. I love talking about the, the games that I make and things that I like. It's great fun. And that's it from Soul Spark. Special thanks to him for going into the mechanics of how he made Rogue Hype. And if you want to make games on your phone, be sure to check out Hype Hype. I'm Hype C. Stay safe out there. And until next time, peace.